Catherine Cheney uh, is going to be from DevEx. Will be hosting a panel discussion on a small panel. We're trying to keep them all small this year. You may have noticed um, on ethics and responsibility in modern technology with two really thoughtful experts on that. One of whom, Paula Goldman, has written for Techonomy uh, several times. So, Catherine, bring out Tara Lyon of Partnership for AI and Paula Goldman from Omidyar Network. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we wanted to open this session up with a question. And hopefully this is not a new question to most of you in the room. But if it is or you're a bit stumped, the purpose of this session is to help you answer it. So the question is, is the technology you're building or the technology that your company is behind potentially going to produce some unintended consequences or be used in unexpected ways? And Everyone on this session agrees that questions like these need to be asked by more people in more places more often. And both Paula, who's to my far right, and Tara, who's just beside me, are working on that very question at their companies. Just to kind of tee up the conversation, uh, first I want to introduce our panelists. I know David mentioned earlier, but Paula Goldman is the global lead of the Tech and Society Solutions Lab at the Omidyar Network here in Silicon Valley. And Tara Lyons, to my right, is the founding executive director of the Partnership on AI, which brings together big AI companies as well as civil society organizations. And both of them are focused in different ways on how to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks of technology. I know questions like that have come up uh, earlier today and yesterday, and this session is devoted to that very topic. But just to tee up the stakes of what we're talking about, I actually want to read a brief excerpt from something David wrote in the issue of Techonomy that you've all seen out and about at this conference. So he's writing about Facebook, and he said, never before has one company's failure had such a devastating impact on the world. Facebook does engender connection, friendship, community building, and user empowerment for billions, but that does not reduce the gravity of the disastrous epidemic of misuse. So I'm a journalist focused on global development. I'm working on a story right now about how Facebook was really used as a tool for evil in Myanmar. And this is the kind of consequences when tech companies are reactive versus proactive. So that's my first question. Can each of you just talk a little bit about what are the risks you're most concerned about and how are you working to move the industry toward being proactive versus reactive when it comes to some of those risks? You want to start? Sure, happy to. Um, thanks for having us here today. Um, as was mentioned, I am the executive director of an organization called the Partnership on AI. And we're a multi-stakeholder initiative that was started roughly about a year ago by a bunch of big tech companies, one of which was Facebook, in addition to several others, including Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, um, and some civil society organizations, including organizations like the MacArthur Foundation and the ACLU. And today, we're a global consortium of over 80 institutions working on responsible and ethical AI development and deployment. So um, you know, this, this question impacts all of the work that we do. And I think if I were to characterize those issues that we care about most, um, I would, you know, it's, it's an expansive question vis-a-vis -vis the work that we're grappling with. But I think that for the partnership, uh, at the center of everything we do is this theory of change, which is sort of focused on the idea that there's a special kind of empowerment and, and power, frankly, that especially senior level technologists, but also the average engineer, mm -hmm. especially in large tech companies, have in impacting responsible technology outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that they cannot do that alone by any means, effectively without being in conversation with other disciplines and other types of institutions, especially those that represent affected communities, mm -hmm. which are traditionally really quite missing, actually, from the conversation around technology development. So that's sort of the heart and center of the problem that we're attempting to solve. And that crosses issues ranging from safety to fairness and bias questions uh, to questions associated with even the future of the labor market and how mm -hmm. automation might impact it. And that's a global set of questions for our organization, mm -hmm. given the expansiveness of, of all these issues and who they touch all over the world. So um, that's a high-level summary, but I'm happy to talk more about what we're up to later, too. We'll dive into more detail. I mean, one of the questions that I'd love to return to is <clears throat> how do we make this more of a global conversation? And you know, I think all of us would agree that that's good to do, but it's also hard to do. 
So exactly how have you done it? But we'll get back to that. Um, for Paula, I, I actually would love for you to talk about some of the risks you're focused on. I know at the Partnership on AI, machine intelligence is the main focus. And at, at the Omniar Network, what you're working on is AI as well as other threats. Yeah. In fact, there was um, a really helpful visual around some of the risks you're focused on, including bad actors, which we talked about earlier with the Myanmar example, but also user understanding, algorithmic bias, data control. So can you talk about what risks keep you up at night and how are you working to tackle them? Well, I'll tell you my uh, almost three-year-old daughter is very worried about the risk of addiction because she keeps telling me, like, Mommy, no phone. Like, put down your phone. <laughs> um, uh, but maybe just even backing up for a second, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Midyar Network, we, um, you know, founded by Piero Midyar, the founder of eBay, very much born in the utopianism of Internet 1.0, use technology to connect people, amazing things are going to happen. Amazing things have happened, right? Um, but after deploying, you know, a billion to a billion three dollars in with into mission-driven startups, we ourselves sort of started having humbling moments in the last few years where we're like, oh my God, there's all these unintended consequences that really well-meaning people did not foresee. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know how many of you were here for the debate last mm -hmm. night, but I think the, the key difference to us, or in my analysis would be, technology is no longer the underdog, right? We got away with, for a decade or two, we got away with a sort of like, we're gonna disrupt everything, it's gonna be great. All of a sudden, we're the top, you know, the top companies in the economy. Um, and that comes with a ton of responsibility. And you know, all of a sudden, elections are being disrupted. There's fear of like you know disrupting people's you know children's neurological development. Um, and what is slow to catch up is the sense of responsibility and the culture of ethics within companies and the way that they operationalize it. So to your point, one of the things we did this year is we partnered with the Institute for the Future after hearing lots of founders say we couldn't have predicted all the things that happen with our company yeah. was like, well, actually, it's not that hard, you know? Like, and so we produced a, you know, like here's a toolkit, here's eight mm -hmm. risk zones to think about. Probably one or two might apply to your company. Yeah. Here's where you can put this into the product requirement docs. Here's how you can think about it when you're shipping stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and, um, and the, the idea is like this becomes, <clears throat> you know, standard just like you know, 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't standard to red team based on security concerns. Now it is. We need to red team for ethics concerns or responsibility concerns. One of the things that I think both of you can comment on is, in terms of who needs to take responsibility for this, it's not just technologists. So you're working on an individual level, you're working on an institutional level, um, but you're not just thinking about tech companies. Um, so, you know, Paula, I know you've talked about investors play a role here, and I'm sure we have investors in the audience. And Tara, you know, drawing on some of your White House experience, I know you believe governments also need to play a role. Uh, and I'm sure we have government representation in here as well. So can each of you just comment on, in terms of what action is needed, who beyond technologists need to be doing something about these threats? Sure. Well, I, I think at the heart of any multi-stakeholder initiative uh, is uh, the principle that, you know, all sorts of different sectors and voices ought to be involved in deliberations on whatever topic is, uh, is being approached, and I think that's certainly the case at the partnership on AI. Um, you know, we work with civil society organizations, as you mentioned, we work with industry, we work closely with academia as well, because the research sector, especially related to AI, um, is really, really important to a lot of these discussions. Um, and certainly, it's also a big part of our mission to advance public understanding about the work that we're doing, but also the work that's happening in the field just writ large. Um, and a big part of that conversation needs to be with the policymaking ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in the former work that I did, um, working in the Obama administration on some of these topics, um, situated in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, it was, it was an understanding of that administration, certainly, I think over almost all eight years of it, from the very beginning, that one of the biggest deficiencies of government policymaking today is that there are not people of technical capacity in rooms making decisions about yeah. the future of a lot of policy issues, which, which just you know, implicitly bleed into questions associated with technology, mm -hmm. if not are confronting them explicitly. So um, you know, we worked uh, on building infrastructure to try to increase that capacity in government. We also worked on bridge building between Silicon Valley and Washington, for example, at least here in the US. Um, in an attempt to alleviate some of those, those challenges as well. And it's interesting, I actually, I moved to San Francisco about a year and a half ago to take this job, and I felt like there was this sort of cavernous gap when I was working mm -hmm. at the White House between tech 
and government uh, insofar as, as the way in which they really culturally understood each other. Yeah. And looking from the opposite direction, sort of westward looking east, mm. I find that that gap is almost even wider, which is really, really fascinating. So and I, problematic. Right, very problematic. And you know, so there's a long way to go, I think, to better get the technology ecosystem to understand the constraints and opportunities mm -hmm. of government. And certainly, I think, acknowledged in all the work that an organization like the Partnership is doing, there's a role for government to play mm -hmm. in policymaking and also in education. Uh, there's a role for standards bodies to play in generating practice and promulgating it effectively. And there's this sort of mushy middle that may be situated amongst or above or around mm -hmm. that, which is this sort of center of best practice and deliberation as an industry and as a, as a multi-sector community in and around how we actually determine what practices will feed um, the implementation that then becomes later questions around policy and standards generation. So that's really sort of where our work is focused. And I'm curious to hear, it's, it's really helpful to hear how both of your backgrounds play into your perspective. So for you, Paula, I know previously you worked uh, in startups in emerging markets largely, and that kind of informs your perspective that investors need to step up. So can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, you know, having now spent the last year, year and a half talking to a lot of disparate folks within tech that are concerned about the problem, but um, not necessarily finding a bigger <clears throat> umbrella, mm -hmm. um, I think one of the places where I haven't seen people step up as much is on the investing side, curiously. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, I think from the, you know, if you think about VC firms, like there's, there's a sort of bubbling up of concern. Um, but it's actually their, their LPs yeah. <laughs> that are more concerned, which is super interesting. It hasn't yet translated into, I think people are still seeing this as like, well, you know, it's maybe a PR risk or um, it's not gonna happen until these companies are, are later stage or something like that. And they're not yet seeing it as business risk. Mm -hmm. And it is yeah. business risk. It's, it's about retaining talent. Mm. There's regulatory risk, obviously, on the table, right? And I think that shift is something that we dramatically need to accelerate. I love that. That's a good takeaway, that this needs to be framed as business risk. Yeah. In fact, I'll ask one more quick question, and then I want to bring in the audience. So if you have questions in mind, um, please get them ready. Um, when it comes to the biggest challenges you're having, we were talking a little bit before we took the stage about, in some ways, it's kind of a branding marketing challenge. People hear ethics, and they go, yeah. that's not my focus. Can you just talk about your biggest challenge? And I, I want to say that before we go to questions, because I think I'd encourage not just questions, but comments and thought partnership if other people are working through some similar challenges. So what are your big challenges? And then we'll go to some questions or comments. Well, yeah, maybe I'll build on what you were saying. I think marketing this, this topic is a really big challenge. I'm a mm -hmm. movement builder by trade. Mm -hmm. I think about how to build aspirational identities. And, um, and I, I'll tell you, when you mentioned the word ethics, people are like, I, I'd like to walk out of this room right now. But luckily, you're all still in this yeah, room, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, or they think it's like someone else's job. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know how, how many of you guys know DJ Patel, who is a former US uh, chief uh, data scientist. And he recently coined this phrase, move purposely and fix things. And like, he printed stickers around it. And I was like, yeah, that's really perfect. And we started promoting mm -hmm. that. But I would ask for all of your help. It's like, what, what is the aspirational identity? Yeah. What would, you know, what would, what would we call ourselves? Mm -hmm. Like, we wouldn't call ourselves ethical technologists. Like, mm -hmm. what's the cool thing to be that would enable this to become aspirational and mainstream? Yeah, I agree. It's a tough question. Plus one to that, yeah. I think, I think uh, evolving and understanding that ethics isn't a plug-in mm -hmm. or like a set of audits you can run at the end of mm -hmm. a process is really important. It needs to be considered from the very outset yeah. of, of a technology development process. So I think that's a mindset shift that definitely needs to happen. I also just think, especially as it relates to my work, that um, that trust building is mm -hmm. is really probably among our biggest challenges. I mean, I, and that's really, again, at the center of a lot of what PAI is trying to do right now, mm -hmm. where it is not necessarily the operating mode of any corporation, regardless of whether or not they're focused on traditional tech, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to be permissive of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I think when they encounter a problem and then need to bring it to a larger community to grapple with mm -hmm. and that especially needs to happen in technology where the issues are so asymmetric in that one company can build a platform that affects millions, if not billions of yeah. people. And there's a lot of sociology that has to go into thinking mm -hmm. about that. And you know, some organizations may find themselves ill-equipped to really have a considered understanding uh, for some of those 
uh, those impacts that you talked about at the very beginning of this session. So I think making sure that there's a culture built in the technology community and in places like the partnership and otherwise where organizations feel like they can say, oh man, this is like a really tough problem we're grappling yeah. with. We really need some help with it before it becomes explosively problematic and making sure that you're bringing other voices into those conversations. And it does sound like it's not just about, as we were discussing a bit earlier, changing practice. It's about changing professional identity, which is no small task. Uh, I want to bring in some questions. So would, can we bring the lights up just so we can see who's in the room? Um, I'm having a hard time seeing some of you, but if you could just say who you are and what brings you here and then join the conversation. Hi, my name's Jack. I'm uh, from Riveted Labs. And um, I wanted to get your guys' perspective on the idea of fiduciary responsibility. So you, you know, Facebook, as we heard yesterday, was able to make some changes in, in pursuit of this goal. And that's partly because Mark Zuckerberg controls so much of the company. Other companies may have the best intentions and want to move in this direction, but they might be afraid of activist investors. They might be afraid of their share price or their mm -hmm. job. So like, what can be done to give those companies the space to make those right decisions? Great question. I'll maybe just start by saying, and I, you probably have thoughts on this too, Paula, but um, I, think, I think fiduciary obligations as a change lever is a really high potential area for mm -hmm. impact. I mean, that you know, optimizing constantly for profit generation is, in some senses, the, the fundament of what has borne a lot of the business models that we've mm -hmm. seen evolve in the technology industry and in other places. And, Thinking creatively about that layer, that fundamental layer, I think is really, really important to incentivizing the kind of, um, uh, you know, obligations and engagement that was discussed earlier around investors and so on and so forth. So I think that's a really, really key piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I would say two things. One, I would hearken back to an earlier comment that I made about reframing this as business risk, yeah. which I think that that shift hasn't happened, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of evidence mm -hmm. behind it. Um, and then the second, I would say, having come from the um, the world of investing and, and, and particularly having kind of helped with the impact investing and mission-driven investing world is mm -hmm. there are a lot of um, also, you know, we talk about activist investors, there's also a counterweight of investors that really, really care about this stuff. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I know some of them are working on indices around like, you know, best practice in tech companies and trying to throw their weight around that and also becoming activists in a positive sense. And so that's a trend that I would watch for in this coming year. Great, that was a great question, thank you. See one right there. Hi, Jody Westby. So to me, I see this as Silicon Valley missed corporate governance 101. Hmm. And if you look at Facebook, if you look at Uber, if you look at some of the instances, they flat out don't get corporate governance and what that means. They just grew up and they and became a big company that still act like a little kid. And the second's on the investor side. So I launched InQtel for the CIA. I have got went to venture capitalists, I don't know, for several years and said, you know, you need me. You're investing <coughs> in these companies and you don't know if they're gonna have illegal consequences, unintended consequences, you need to think about that. Do you know what they all said uniformly? Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. Eh. By the time that occurs, we'll have our money and we'll be out. Mm. And so, you know, until that changes on the investor side and until Silicon Valley realizes they can't just be an IPO, go take people's money, have shareholders, and not meet corporate governance, mm -hmm. nothing's going to change. Mm -hmm. I think you both agree. And you're working on the change, but I'm what more is needed? More, I'm a little more optimistic. Yeah? Um, I do Here. think the investment lever is a, is a hard one. Yeah. Um, but look, like... In the last year, one of the trends that has really surprised us is the extent to which, for example, employees have been really active mm. on this, right? And in a hugely tight labor market, yeah. companies are really worried, and rightly mm. so, and have to develop very sophisticated ways of involving employees in these decisions. And, you know, and that's been a force for change, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that starts to bubble up into board decisions. And those board decisions start to bubble mm -hmm. up on an, you know, an investor calls, right? Like we've seen that on a number of quarterly earnings calls, companies about these crises, yeah. right? So I don't, I don't disagree with you that the structural analysis is like, yeah, if the money at the top doesn't care, it's not going to change. Yeah. But I'm more sanguine that there are other, there are ways that are starting to affect the money mm. at the top. Yeah, that's helpful. We only have about a minute left, and I wish we could bring in more questions, but hopefully we can continue the conversation here at Techonomy and beyond. Um, but I want to give both of you the chance to 
share any final words, something we didn't get to, um, or a call to action. I think, I love the point Paula made earlier about this new mantra for Silicon Valley. And any final words about how we get there or calls to action for this group? I mean, I, I would just springboard off of Paula's just recent comment in saying that it's, uh, really easy to underestimate the impact that a single individual can have on the tone of, of public and industry-wide conversation on these issues. But we have seen, proved over and over again in the past 18 months or so that that has been the case. And it really has started with a very small group of individual change makers. So I think, and that's you know sort of the, um, the thesis behind PAI as well. Mm -hmm. It started with individual voices saying something like this was important. So I, I just think that's really, really important to remember. Yeah, and I would echo that. And I would like think about everyone in this room, like, you know, all of us are in positions where we can influence this debate mm -hmm. and have like a real responsibility to do so. Mm -hmm. I'm hearkening back to sometime late last year, there was a conference at Harvard where uh, an engineer presented an algorithm that was about um, helping police detect uh, gang violence. Mm -hmm. And he got a question at, in the audience and, and they were like, couldn't that lead to sort of civil rights concerns? Like, and his answer was, I'm just an engineer. Right? Yeah. And that's, I think, the core of the problem for all of us, whether you're an investor, you're an executive, you're, you know, you're an engineer. This is all of our problem. Yeah. It's all of our legacy mm -hmm. as an industry. And so we all need to like, own this as ours mm -hmm. and like, our ability to do positive things in the world. So yeah. That's a really powerful way to end. Um, I mean, just in talking with the two of you, I think of you as two experts when it comes to ethics and responsibility in modern technology. That's why you're here. But your point is we all need to be talking about this, and not just here, but globally, because uh, the stakes are too high not to. So please join me in thanking our panelists.